If everybody would mute themselves, I want to welcome you all. And as I watch, I'll try to admit others as they come in. Um, so excuse me if I'm looking at the top of my screen while I do this for latecomers. Um, welcome. We are going to have a big attendance tonight and uh, the 67 Connects uh, series is working well. We started in the spring and it's now the fall and we're gonna go into the winter. Um, can't tell you how happy we are to have Marty with us tonight. And uh, for those of you who may not know, Dr. Martin Allen Samuels or Marty, I just can tell you that his achievements uh, for his academic and medical uh, field in neurology are well known to many of us. And for those of you who don't know, I would ask you to use that new brain enhancement tool called the internet to go and look at his full story because we're not gonna tell it. I'm gonna do a little different introduction tonight. I'm gonna to introduce Marty uh, with a personal story and also some anecdotal notes. So I'm, I'm sorry, I keep clicking in the site for these latecomers to class, Marty. They get five demerits, I think. Um, Marty and I uh, met on a beautiful day in the fall of 1963 in Sage A, and we became roommates for four years at Williams. And at the same time, our parents, Marty's parents, Sydney and Miriam, and my parents, Doc and Barbara, met, and they became bonded and lifelong friends. Uh, and in fact, my brother, and I and Marty gave eulogies at my father's memorial service. And why Marty, you might ask? Well, my father called Marty his third son and my mother wouldn't allow the memorial service to go on without Marty being there. Um, I went to Harvard when Marty was appointed the first incumbent of the Miriam Sidney Joseph Professorship in Neurology, an endowed chair to be occupied by future chairs of the Department of Neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. The name was in honor of Marty's parents. Why was I invited? Uh, I think that I was invited because when Marty honored his parents, he was also honoring mine because there were two sets of parents that were good friends through life and they sacrificed so much to educate both of us. Uh, I want to tell an anecdotal story that I think highlights Marty's career more than any of the official dumb that you'll read on the internet. When my father was a little older than we are now, he had a seemingly serious neurological episode, body swelling, pain, especially in the head area. And in the small town of Toms River, New Jersey, there weren't that many good internal medicine docs. My father's former doctor, a high school friend of mine, and a fellow classmate, incidentally, of Don Steinmuller at Cornell Medical School, name of Rich Yeager, he had become a hospital administrator. So he referred my father to a Dr. Cuzo. Dr. Cuzo was big, brash, bold, and very self-assured. And uh, when the family called me, they said that Dr. Cuso didn't think it was temporal arteritis, a very serious condition. He diagnosed a less serious condition. They then put dad on the phone. And I said, he really did need a second opinion. And uh, I've got a couple more in the waiting room. They're all coming in, Marty. And uh, he said, Dr. Cuso, I'd like a second opinion. And Dr. Cuso said, are you kidding me? You know, why do you think Rich Yeager referred you to me? I'm, I'm probably the best in this area of New Jersey and you don't need anybody better than me, do you? And uh, why do you think Rich Yeager referred you to me? And uh, dad said, no, it's not in this area. This is a doctor in Boston. He says, what is his name? He says, his name is Marty Samuels. Cuso said, what the hell? You mean Dr. Martin Samuels, chair of neurology at Brigham and Women's? Dad said, yeah, that, that's the guy. 
Cuso said, how in the name of God would you know such a famous doctor? Dad said, I don't give a damn how famous he is, but I trust him because he's my adopted son. Dr. Guso and my father became best friends. And because of this, Cuso took care of my dad for 13 years until he passed away. And this story tells you Marty's passion for the interface of general medicine and neurology had reached even a small town of Toms River, New Jersey, by way of Cuso attending Marty's session, several sessions he had on neurology and general medicine. So tonight, Marty's passion reaches us through the medium of Zoom. So Marty, before you take questions on neurology, neuroscience, and the aging brain, only a few of us resemble that aging brain comment, Marty. <laughs> Please tell us briefly how you got interested in neurology. Larry, thanks. It's uh, I remember that day very, very distinctly back in the uh, in that beautiful fall day when we met for the first time. And who would who would have guessed? You know, a lifelong uh, a lifelong friendship for us and for our folks. And uh, I think it really is emblematic of what Williams means to a lot of us. It's it's not just a, a four year experience in college like most people experience. It's a really a lifelong experience. And I, I thank you and uh, Huff and uh, for presence of our president of our class and Alan, who's I see in the background there, uh, for for creating this uh, this novel idea of having people say something about what their life has been like and for us to get back together again. I, I know everybody really is enjoying this enormously and I thank you a great deal. I don't wanna take much time talking about myself because I want to uh, make this a uh, an interactive uh, occasion where we can talk uh, to each other. I'll just tell you briefly that uh, as a uh, Jewish boy uh, growing up in a suburb on the east side of Cleveland, I was uh, in a way programmed to be a doctor from the beginning. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't even know when my mother started to uh, give me a stethoscope for, for, for a toy, but uh, you're supposed to be a doctor. You know, for a Jewish family uh, in this kind of environment, this is like being a, a priest for a Catholic uh, family. Uh, this is the ultimate. And uh, I do remember the person who inspired me to be a doctor, and it was my pediatrician, whose name was uh, J.W. Epstein. Uh, he made he made house calls. If you remember, doctors making house calls, and um, uh, I, I might be sick with the measles or something like this. My mother would call the doctor, and uh, when the doctor came, it was it was literally like the mayor of the city was coming, or or even even Al Rosen, the famous third baseman for the Cleveland Indians. Uh, as, as, as important as that, everybody had to change their underwear. We all had to wash up. Uh, the doctor was coming and uh, he would pull up on his little jalopy in the front and come in with his black bag and uh, come and examine me. And as he is examining me, he would, my mother would be standing there very anxious and she was afraid that I might have polio. Everybody was afraid of their kids uh, getting polio in the summer in those days. I'm sure you all remember your folks being afraid to send you to the local swimming pool for fear of getting polio. And um, Dr. Epstein would, um, would tap on my back. And as he was tapping, he would say, good, very good, fine, normal. A technique that I used uh, today in my office many, many times to reassure people. And I could just see the tension come out of my mother's face. Uh, the doctor had this power to, uh, to relieve anxiety, to re relieve fear. And I thought to myself as a little kid, I, I, I gotta be something like this. This is what I want. This is what I wanna be able to do. And uh, some years later, when I was a teenager, I was still going to see this pediatrician. And I found myself sitting in a room with a lot of uh, little babies and I'm a teenager. And I went in to see him in his office. And I said, Dr. Epstein, how long can I see you? Uh, I'm growing up now. And he said, I'll take care of you until you're a doctor. So you see, I was programmed from the very beginning and Dr. Epstein made sure that I knew it. Um, I went into neurology, Larry, because uh, neuro the, the brain is who we are. Everything else is a uh, virtual existence. That is to say, we depend entirely on our, on our nervous system for the way we perceive the world 
and everything that we do and think and feel. So to me, it, this is the essential organ of the human being. And uh, it's, it's a fascinating organ. There's been enormous progress in the neurosciences and uh, neurology really is the clinical neuroscience, uh, the medical neuroscience field. And that's why I was drawn into neurology. So that's all I'm gonna say for now. I, I really would like to uh, delve into whatever is on your mind uh, about the nervous system, about aging, uh, whatever you think is uh, of interest. Let's just, uh, let's just talk about it together as a group. Good. Um, I think I'm getting feedback. No. Okay. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to raise your hands. And as you recall from past Zoom sessions, that's either down under uh, participants button or the reaction button. And I will see in order you raised your hand and be able to call on you. And when I do, if you'd unmute yourself, I'll ask you to do that and ask Marty the questions. Um, I will start with the first question if I could. And Marty, I think this, uh, I, I think this probably is for most of us. Uh, meet a few neighbors on the street, go back in, can't remember their names, or you go in a room and you forget why you've gone there. Should I be worried? Should we be worried? Should we be tested for dementia or Alzheimer's with those things happening? Well, I'll tell you, Larry, um, it's a very good question. It's a question that all of us uh, ask ourselves. And um, in order to answer that, I need to teach you a little, a little bit of neurology. Uh, and that is something about, uh, something about memory. It turns out there are several different memory systems in our nervous system. Let me, let me tell you very, very briefly about them, and then I'll answer your, your question. The first one is uh, called immediate recall or working memory. This is the memory system we use to remember something long enough to do something right away. For example, call me back on this number, 617-732-5355. And what you do is you rehearse that in your mind, don't you, as you go to the telephone. 617-732-5355. That, that uh, memory system is called the attentional system. You have to focus on one thing and hold everything else at bay. So let me give you an example of this for all of you right now. So as we're talking right now, your bladders are filling up, aren't they? <laughs> Think for a moment. They are, aren't they? But just a moment ago, most of you uh, didn't notice that, did you? Because you were thinking about this Zoom session and this uh, question that Larry answered about, uh, about immediate recall. That's the attentional mechanism. It's like a spotlight that moves from place to place and it's voluntary. I can focus on something long enough to go to the phone and dial the number. Without that, you can't learn anything. And a disorder of that system is called attention deficit disorder. Something that's uh, primarily seen in young folks and children, but we see it in adults as well. That's the first memory system. You have to be awake and alert and be able to use your uh, your uh, attention mechanism to focus on something and hold other things at bay, like your bladder filling up or that belt around your waist. You can feel it, can't you? It's there. But a moment ago, you didn't, uh, you didn't notice it. The second system uh, that we are interested in is called episodic memory. That's a memory that you can keep in mind for a little while. And it's very easy for me to test it. I'm going to test it in all of you. Uh, this is the honor system, just like William's. Uh, so I won't know what you're saying, but do uh, play along with me. You'll learn a lot more. I'm going to tell you a story, and I want you to repeat this story after me and memorize it. Are you ready? Here we go. Tom and Jill went fishing, and Jill caught three striped bass. Say it back. Tom and Jill went fishing, and Jill caught three striped bass. You've now, I've now tested your attentional mechanism. You were able to repeat it. In uh, three to five minutes, I'm gonna ask you that story. Memorize it. Yeah. Now, one other thing I'd like you to memorize, I'm gonna give you three objects, window, baseball, and lipstick. Can you say those back to me? Window, baseball, and lipstick. 
Keep those in mind for the next three to five minutes. That's called episodic memory. There's a particular system in the brain that does this job. And uh, 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 if I were to do a functional image like a PET scan on your brain, knowing while you were doing this task that we're doing right now, you're, you're memorizing those two, that story and those three unrelated objects, that would light up. Uh, your neurons would be firing away working on this. The third memory system is called semantic memory. Semantic means, memory, means, uh, means, means meaning. So let me ask you a question and see if you have the answer. Who was the uh, first president of the United States? That's easy, isn't it? Let me ask you one further question. When specifically did you learn that? Be specific, tell me exactly where you were when you learned that. You can't, can you? Because you know what happened? That memory of George Washington went out of that little short-term short memory system and it's all over your brain. Part of your brain has an image of the dollar bill with his picture on it. Some of your brain has the memory of the story of him cutting down the cherry tree and then uh, committing, telling his father that giving up to his father that he had done this. It's practically impossible to erase that memory. It's all over your brain. And there are two other systems, very brief, and we'll come back to the, uh, to the answer to your question. One of them is called cerebellar memory or motor memory, the ability to ride a bicycle or to drive a stick shift automobile or to play the piano, assuming you could play it once, once upon a time. That's done by a little organ in the back of the brain, the cerebellum. And uh, it's also very hard to erase. Arthur Rubenstein, when he was very old and sick, could play beautifully because that was so deep in his cerebellum. And finally, there's Pavlovian conditioning. And you know all about Pavlov's dogs. We don't test that clinically. So what was the story that I told you? Say it out loud. Uh, Tom and Jill went fishing and Jill caught three striped bass. And what about the three unrelated objects? Window, baseball, and lipstick. You passed. So you have very, very good episodic memory. Neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease have a predisposing effect on episodic memory. And uh, they tend to spare the other kinds of memory. So when you go in a room and when you get in there, you don't realize when you were there, why you were there, which of those five memory systems is affected? You can answer that question for yourself. It's attention, isn't it? It's an attentional problem. You lost focus, your spotlight has lost focus. And as we get older, this becomes more and more difficult, not because there's something wrong with our brain, but because we just have so much more information that we've accumulated for our spotlight to hold on one place is much, much more difficult than it is when we were five years old and all we had to do is go to school and study reading. Your, your life is much more complex. So that is, is not, the answer to your question is, that is not a worrisome memory disorder. That's just an attentional problem. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a question. I have a question. Who, who is that? Turner? It's a Turner hey. Smith. Who is speaking, Larry? I can't tell. Yeah, this is uh, Bill Taylor from South Carolina. Hi, Bill. Uh, How you doing? Retired pediatrician. I just, um, you know, maybe a little off topic, but I'm interested if you and your associates have been studying the uh, neurological complications of the long haulers, the COVID, you know, uh, patients who recover but have permanent neurological issues that, you know, if that's something you've been into, we yep. see so much of it down here. Yep. Yep. You see, it. we're going to see it everywhere. Bill, it's a very, very good question. I was hoping somebody would ask me about uh, COVID and the neurological complications of COVID. I, th I think you're, you know, people are very interested in this. If you read history, it turns out that every time, every time, there is some sort of a widespread catastrophe. By catastrophe, I mean war, famine, disease, you name it, any widespread catastrophe. Um, 
after that catastrophe is over, there is a, uh, uh, a long tail of uh, symptomatic problems that people have as a result of being exposed to that catastrophe. Now in the old days, only the people in the immediate area were really at risk. So if a building collapsed in, uh, in Salt Lake City, uh, only the people in Salt Lake City would know about it. It would take days for anybody else to hear about it because they would have to wait for the newspapers to come. So, so a relatively small number of people would actually be exposed to the stress of the uh, building collapsing. Now, of course, because of the, the speed at which information travels around the world, within microseconds of that building collapsing, millions and probably hundreds of millions of people are affected at once by this stressful event. This happened uh, very dramatically at 9-11. Uh, when, when we, all of us are exposed to an acute stress, we have a defense mechanism that we can use to get, get over it. And that, that defense mechanism is called dissociation. I, I'm gonna tell you a story of my own dissociation experience and, I, and I'm sure all of you can relate to this. All of us have had this. I was driving on a big highway here in Boston some years ago. Uh, I had a Jeep Wagoneer and it was, on a, it was on a slippery, icy surface. And as I was driving uh, uh, bad weather, a big 18-wheeler ahead of me suddenly turned sideways and lost control of his truck. Uh, and I was in traffic right behind him. Uh, everything slowed down for me. I, I calmly turned my wheel and uh, drove this uh, Jeep Wagoneer into the, into the median. And I drove up the median very calmly around this, this uh, parallel truck and back on the road, no problem at all. And then about 15 seconds later, I got a horrible pain in my back and I started to become tremulous all over. I pulled over to the side of the road. That's the, uh, that's the dissociation effect. The stress allowed me to slow time down and make accurate decisions. And then I had to pay for it afterwards. And that, that pain in my back was actually my adrenal glands contracting, excreting uh, uh, adrenaline. I bet there's nobody in this group that can't relate to that experience, right? This is a survival mechanism that's, uh, that's uh, uh, been, uh, been selected by, by, by natural selection. Uh, this is how our ancestors uh, escaped from in the wild from jaguars. But there's a price to pay for this. And that price to pay is the long tail after an acute catastrophe like this. So you can predict that, uh, that after every major catastrophe of this type, there will be an illness that will follow it. And that illness will be very stereotyped. It will be characterized by uh, exhaustion, tiredness, trouble keeping one's thoughts straight, what people call brain fog, not being able to concentrate uh, well, often with systemic sort of uh, aches and pains. And if you think about that, those are really the symptoms of depression. This is a, an induced depression caused by an enormous stressor, which now, unfortunately, all of us have to, have to share with, uh, with each other because of uh, the television news and the internet. So uh, uh, th there's no doubt, Bill, that there will be, an, and, there, and there has been after every prior catastrophe, uh, a tale, which they're now calling the long haulers. And uh, not only are you seeing them there in the Carolinas, but we're seeing them all over the world. And uh, this will burn out over time. Uh, those of us who have been in medicine long enough, uh, you know, almost a half century for me, I've seen this on multiple occasions. I saw it after 9-11. Um, I saw it after the Vietnam War. Uh, you name it, any kind of horrible catastrophe is followed by this uh, thing. Now, there, there is no evidence at all that the virus is actually active uh, all that time afterwards. It's not the virus itself. It's a reaction of our nervous system to the very severe stress 
of uh, of the of the COVID epidemic. Okay, does that, I mean, does yeah, that get yeah. to your question? Uh, do you have any follow up yeah. about that, Bill? Yeah. No, I I appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, no, thank you. That was very helpful. I appreciate it, and thanks for doing the talk. I'm going to ask Turner Smith to unmute and ask his question, and then George Cannon, I think, is next. Turner, it's great to see you again. You have to unmute, Turner. Marty. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Turner. It's great to see you. Yeah, can you hear what you're saying? And I am, um, I am incredibly concerned about the way society is headed right now. Um, when I look at um, I look at the <clears throat> at the the conventions, you know, and what's going on with society, I, I wonder how it's going to ever change. I mean, I hear I hear what you're saying. I mean, I look at COVID, and I I look at I look at the um, the folks who are anti-vaxxers. How does that ever change? If it doesn't change, we are, I feel we are really in trouble. Well, I'll tell Is you, Turner. Not true? Uh, uh, I'll tell you, Turner. Marty, I'm, I'm, I'm wonder. I, I think. Marty, uh, oh, I'm Marty, sorry. Keep, all, I'm, keep I'm going. Really going to you. see you. You've been a friend for. Uh, Larry, should I should I comment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Turner, uh, I'm a, a a firm student in, of history. Uh, I'm very interested in medical history and neurological history. Uh, and uh, I tell I I told some of my young residents recently, if you ever think that you've got a new idea, that means that you haven't read history or you haven't taken your lithium that day. Lithium is the treatment for, ma for mania. Uh, anybody who thinks they've got a new idea or that something that we're living through is so unique needs to read history. In my, in my own view, from I'm speaking now from the history of medicine, there's nothing new about this. Uh, I, uh, people have, co have collected evidence over time that, uh, that acute stressors in the society, they've, they've come in different forms, right? There was once the Black Plague. That was a very, very bad thing, right? Uh, people who were in contact with it had dissociative states and behaved ir irrationally for a while, and then it burned out. Now the problem that we have, Turner, is that uh, the whole world has to, has to suffer with it. Uh, I listen to NPR in the morning. I probably many of you do uh, here in Boston. It comes on. My alarm clock goes, goes off at 6 a.m. Uh, and uh, every day it is a list of frightening, horrible things that people in the distant past would not have heard about. I joke with Susan, my wife Susan, and I say, you know, that all they care about are hurricanes, floods, murders mass murders and so on uh it, that of course that's how you get people's attention that's how you get the advertisers but it's very very unhealthy for all of us turner very unhealthy um and uh i think one thing to do about it is to is to take a break from it every once in a while and give your brain a chance to recover uh from this uh, barrage and i do think that reading history will help a great deal because it it gives you it it, um, it gives you the perspective that we are Marty. not alone. That people have always gone through uh, periods like this before, but without the kind of information system. I love what you're saying, but I look I look at I look back at the turmoil that was going on in 1850 and 1860 before the Civil War. I mean, it was it was far more ex extraordinary than what we're dealing with today. But I look at it and I just say, you know, can we deal with it, it you know, going forward from here? And, <clears throat> and I guess we can. I think we can, Turner. Our brains are, are very flexible. Uh, we've changed over the ages to adapt to new environments. 
and we're going to continue to do so. I'm not pessimistic about it. I'm just a believer that have, we're, we're, we're going to, through something that other people have fa faced over, over generations. I have to interrupt you, Marty, because you're becoming a soothsayer rather than a neurologist. So I'm going well, to ask John Cannon, George Cannon, well, to ask you his question. <laughs> it's all the same stuff. It's all the same organ. After all. <laughs> go ahead. George, George, go ahead. Unmute yeah, yourself. Marty, I, I, I so agree with you about the uh, the um, uh, media taking things that have always happened throughout history and just exploding them so much that it makes more of a mental problem for us. But my question is, I'm just curious. Uh, I didn't realize that the Pavlovian memory system is a whole separate system. And I know you said you don't test it uh, clinically, but could you just talk about it a little bit? It seems kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Ivan Pavlov showed that you could, <clears throat> pardon me, induce a uh, memory in, and he, he used dogs mm -hmm. by ringing a bell and then giving uh, some food and then uh, ringing a bell and giving some food and connecting these two stimuli with each other in the dog's brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a while, you could ring the bell and the dog would salivate with, uh, without the food, mm -hmm. uh, implying that it had learned it had put in its memory banks uh, the connection between the bell and the food. Mm -hmm. Now, this has now been studied at a molecular basis down, down, down to single cells in incredibly simple animals. For example, the important work in this area has been done in the sea slug, an animal that, uh, is called a plisia. That animal uh, doesn't have a brain. It has only some neurons here and there, a few clumps of neurons that are called ganglia. It doesn't even have a spinal cord. And yet, if you uh, stick it with a little pin, it will, it will move away. And you can train it with a light followed by the pin to move away when the light comes on. So, uh, so now in those individual cells, it's been studied of what, what actually happens to the molecules to allow those cells to make memories. It's called long-term potentiation. It's a very important uh, advance in basic neuroscience. So yes, it's a, it's a separate memory system. Uh, we don't uh, ring a bell and give food in the office uh, and do Pavlovian conditioning, but we actually all are subject to Pavlovian principles. One of the things that I'm very interested in that you've probably, you've probably heard is the phenomenon of sudden death from fear. This is uh, uh, something that's been known for centuries, of course, but now we know something about it. And basically, there's a connection between the brain and the heart. So that in the face of a very severe stressor, let's take, for example, the 9-11 uh, event. For about a week following the 9-11 event, the event, uh, the death from sudden death in New York City went up by eightfold. People dropping dead of just experiencing at a distance, those uh, two buildings collapsing. And every time an acute stress occurs, this happens. This has been studied with earthquakes, volcano ruptures. Um, that's, that is Pavlovian. Uh, the, uh, and uh, so, that, so yes, it is a separate system. It's connected to what, what we call our autonomic nervous system, our autonomous nervous system, our automatic nervous system. And uh, we have no we have no control over this, but every time there's a major catastrophe, lo and behold, there's an increased risk of sudden death from, from heart attack. And the, the brain has, its, has control not only over the heart, but over all the visceral organs, all the internal organs, the liver, the kidneys, the skin. There are diseases that go with each of those that are caused by problems with the brain. Does that get to your point? Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, really very impressive, Marty. Thank you. Oh, uh, it's great, Marty, it's great to see you. Marty, uh, Brian, Brian Hickman has a question about brain health, and then Rick Ackerley is on board. Go ahead, Brian, if you'd unmute yourself and talk to Marty. Brian, I'm not hearing you. You've got to unmute yourself, I think. I'm asking him to unmute. Brian? Well, we'll go to Rick. Go ahead, Rick. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Your mouth is moving, but I can't hear you, Rick. You're muted. 
There yeah, you go. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. Go Mar ahead. Marty, nice, to, that, nice to see you, Rick. Nice to see you too. And thanks for doing this. And thank you also, uh, John and Larry and, and everybody for being here. It's so great to be back with the class again. This is this the best part of all. Exactly. What you said uh, it reminded me of uh, the phantom limb uh, experiments. And, um, and I'm interested, I wonder if, you, I suppose you know about them. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, there must be some uh, very positive things that can be done from, uh, well, anyway, it, you know what I mean by phantom limb, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. And there uh, must be, you must be able to, you know, if you could trick the, trick the brain into, into stuff like that, maybe be all sorts of good things you can trick the brain into. Absolutely. Rick, you've, you've, you've hit on something really very interesting. And for those who uh, haven't thought about this in a long time, if a, if, if a person were, were to lose a limb, uh, an amputation from, uh, let's say, some kind of trauma, uh, the brain will still have a picture of that limb the way it was. And in fact, when surgeons uh, actually amputate a limb, they purposely put the foot in a comfortable position when they go ahead to amputate the limb. Because if they put it in an uncomfortable position, that'll be the way the brain will remember it forever. Uh, and so the brain, and it's in the parietal lobe of the brain, you know the brain has the frontal lobes here, which are the part of the brain that separates us from primates, from, from other primates. We have a bigger frontal lobe it's for planning. It's meant to uh, take into consideration the long-term effects of a short-term decision. Uh, that's, that's how we're different than, than our, at least some of us are different than our, than our primate relatives. Um, uh, it, the motor strip is in the, where, where we control motor function is in the frontal lobes, but then behind it is the parietal lobes back here. The parietal lobes are the sensory limb and in there, there's a, there's a map of our body, which for many years was called the homunculus. It's politically correct to call it the homunculus, incorrect to call it the homunculus because it means the man. And it, it really means a man or woman, it's the human. But in the brain, there are neurons that represent all parts of your body, including the internal organs like your heart. Uh, so if you cut a limb off below the knee, let's say, the map still exists in the brain. And uh, that's why they put it in a comfortable position because you don't want to have a memory of your foot in a very odd position. Um, and people feel things in that organ. And if you stimulate at the stump where it was cut off, there's a thumb in there. If it's the leg, it would be a big toe and little pinky and so on would all be mapped onto that space and it goes up into your brain. So you say, well, where, what good could come out of this? What good could come out of this is that the brain would, might be flexible enough to, uh, to take over functions which have been lost from disease. And uh, there's a great interest in doing this by stimulating the brain through the skull using magnetic stimulation. So this is a non-invasive thing. You don't have to do surgery. You just put these uh, powerful magnets on, uh, around the head. And um, you can make the brain do whatever you want it to do. And maybe we can make people uh, think more clearly. This is called um, cosmetic neurology. Uh, remember the days, uh, Larry, you were a math, you took a lot of math. Remember the days in high school where we, uh, were, we would take a slide rule into the examination. I mean, everybody here remembers what a slide rule is. My residents have no idea what a slide rule is. Uh, and then along came the computer, the, um, the calculator. And they said, well, you can take your slide rule in, but you can't take your calculator. In. And then they finally said, well, you can take your calculator in, but you can't take your computer in. But now you can take your computer in, but you can't put on the magnets on your head because that'll unfairly enhance your ability to see an A on the test. This is known as cosmetic neurology. It sounds like uh, futuristic, but it actually is happening at this very moment. Uh, and we're using magnetic stimulation to get the brain to do things that it's forgotten to do. 
or use parts of the brain to do jobs that the other parts of the brain used to do, like return language after a stroke or return motor function after a stroke. So you're right on, right on target there uh, in, in asking about uh, the, the phantom limb. It was the beginning, uh, sort of the tip of an iceberg uh, of a whole area of neuroscience. Marty, we have a lot of hands up. And I, and I think uh, Brian Hickman has been able to unmute himself, Brian. And then we have Paul Lipoff, Ron Bodenson, and David McCarran. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, hi, Marty. Um, my question has to do with maintaining our, our, our brain health. I mean, there are obvious things like exercise and good diet, but are there any discoveries that say, I, you see ads on TV saying, take this pill and you'll have a better memory or you'll, less, I mean, what advice, what, what advice do you have for us to keep our brains active and healthy? Right. Well, that's a, that's a very, very important question. And a lot of people are interested in it. I'm going to give you a very simple answer, but do you remember Carter's little liver pills? <laughs> yes. yes. It turned out that Carter's little liver pills were neither uh, liver nor little. It was a hoax, right? Uh, I'm afraid that 99% uh, of the stuff you hear about that's supposed to be good for your brain uh, doesn't even get into your brain. It's like the little liver pills, which were neither little nor liver. Uh, it's dissolved in your stomach. And uh, people are kidding themselves when they, when they uh, think that that's going to do it. You're going to be surprised to hear my answer, probably. Um, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. And Dave McCarran's going to ask a question in a minute, and he'll, he'll tell you more about it, I'm sure. Because he's a world's expert in this. Paul Lipoff, so what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Paul Lipoff, uh, you unmute yourself and have at it. Oh, I was going to let me finish. Let me finish my sentence for just a okay. second there. Uh, he's trying to get me to go faster because uh, we're going to run out of time. But but that's okay. Uh, Larry's always told me what to do. Uh, um, yeah. So the answer is what you said in your first uh, sentence. Uh, physical exercise is the only intervention which has been proved to slow the progression of dementia. Proved. Now, that, you know, that, that, that's a high bar, but there's, there's no other intervention. The other interventions for heart disease, like lowering your cholesterol, stopping smoking, drinking moderately, that is, don't stop drinking, but don't drink too much. Uh, those are all good, but the only one for dementia is, is physical exercise. And there's a lot of um, interest in the neuroscience community about what the mechanism of that is, and I, it's too complicated to get into right now, too, too much to, to talk about this evening. But, but that's a fact uh, that, that you can count on. So just do what your cardiologists uh, and your internists tell you to do to lower your risk of heart disease, and you're going to help your brain but try to physically exercise every day, not to exhaustion, but try to exercise every day. That's the most important thing. Sorry, Ron, are you on next? No, Paul, Paul Lipoff is next. Oh, Paul. Paul, you have to hey, Paul. Hey, Marty. How are you? Marty, hey, great Paul. to see you. Thank you very much for doing this. And thank you to everyone that organized it. If, as you say, the brain can kill you, it can uh, make you sick it makes sense that it might be able to heal you and make you better. What's the status of research in terms of using the brain to, to heal to, to, for recovery from serious injuries, from serious uh, diseases, cancer it's, and the like? Yeah, it's a very, very good, uh, a very good question. And there's no doubt that there is some interaction between nervous system activity and the activity of many uh, uh, visceral diseases, diseases of uh, what I call the lower organs. I hope you don't mind my calling them the lower <laughs> organs like that. Those are the organs other than the brain I call the lower organs. Um, so there, there is evidence that, uh, that by, um, by certain relaxation techniques uh, and uh, uh, yoga and so on, that one can uh, modify physical complaints. Uh, and in fact, I use it a great, great deal in my practice of, uh, of neurology. There was a, um, 
uh, a great neurologist in the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century in, um, in France by the name of Babinski. Uh, every doctor knows his name because there's a test that we do in medicine called the Babinski test. But the key thing about Babinski was that he was interested in, uh, in psychosomatic illnesses, illnesses of the lower organs. You know what I mean by that now, caused by the brain. And uh, he created a word for this, uh, for this, uh, these disorders, uh, which was a, which derived from a Greek root. The word was pithiatism, P-I-T-H-I-A-T-I-S-M, pithiatism, which means caused by suggestion and cured by persuasion. Caused by suggestion and cured by persuasion. And just this afternoon in my office, I'm. I feel as though I used the uh, Dr. Epstein technique and I cured a number of people by using their brains. And the, the, one of the most important thing, of course, is to relieve people's fear and anxiety, unnecessary fear and anxiety about harboring horrible diseases that they don't harbor. And uh, by helping one to, to focus using the attentional mechanisms that we talked about, uh, focus away from the, the bad actions of the nervous system, one can, can, can reverse a disease. And uh, I think we're just at the beginning of, uh, of an era in which this is gonna be more scientifically proved, but we already have quite a bit of evidence that this really happens. Does that answer your question, Paul, or get, uh, addresses it anyway? Very good, thank you very much. You're welcome. Ron Bodison. Ron, it's uh, nice to see you, buddy. Hi, Doc, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good, have you I'm good. Have you ever forgotten to uh, how to tie a bow tie or it looked like you sort of know how to do that? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'll tell you something funny though, Ron. Every, uh, you, maybe you've all experienced this. I, I hope you have. Um, I think so. Every once in a while, I do forget to tie it, mm -hmm. how to tie it. And I say to myself, my God, I must be getting demented or something. You know, I can't remember which, how to tie a bow tie. But you now know the answer to that, right, Ron? It's, it's an attentional mechanism. Your life is filled with a lot of important things other than tying your bow tie. And every once in a while, you'll forget to do something that is, should have been rote uh, and wasn't. It's, but I don't think it's a disease. At least I'm going to continue to believe that it isn't. Anyhow, no, Ron, go, go right, ahead. Right, right. You're, you're listening to NPR while you're trying to tie it and you got two things going on. Well, here's, here's my question. It sort of ties in what you saw, say is cure by using the brain and the phantom limb. And I know you sort of set up this nice situation where when the doctor cuts off the limb, he puts in a comfortable position. But the fact of the matter, you're cutting off a limb because something's drastically wrong. And often what's wrong is terrible pain. And so, uh, I, what I understand about phantom limbs is that uh, they not only, a person not only thinks they're there, but they feel the terrible pain. Uh, yes. Because, yes. So yes. I read a study uh, a few years ago, and I may have this wrong because it's been some time, is how do you cure uh, the feeling of terrible pain in a phantom limb? And my recollection is you cure it with the brain is Absolutely. you show a photograph of a good limb and you do that enough or once, I, you tell me, and it resolves the pain that comes with the memory of the phantom painful limb. W what's your knowledge of that? Well, well Ron, that's, uh, th that's a really uh, very, very good observation and very uh, insightful. <clears throat> it brings up the whole history of what is, what is pain and where is it in the nervous yeah. system? Yeah. And uh, there are three concepts I'm going to teach you about in the next three minutes. Uh, no susception, pain, and suffering. And they have their own neuroanatomy. No susception is the ability to recognize a potentially tissue damaging stimulus. Uh, a potentially tissue damaging stimulus we call a noxious stimulus. An example would be hot or cold or pinprick. Those are potentially tissue damaging. There's a system in our nervous system that starts way out in the skin where little nerve endings are identified for, purpose, for this purpose exclusively. 
So when there is something which is potentially tissue damaging, they fire a signal to the central nervous system. Then there's the second concept of pain. Pain is, uh, is an experience that only the brain can have. As far as we know, it doesn't happen in the peripheral part of the nervous system where all the little nerves and dendrites are in the, in the skin. It takes uh, uh, the brain and there's, an, there's a group of nuclei in the center of the brain, which are called the thalamus. The thalamus is the home of pain. It decides whether something is painful or not painful. It's an, it's a, it's an abnormal sensation, an unpleasant sensation caused by too much nociception. So a good example would be a fractured femur. You fracture your thigh, uh, that's a painful stimulus, potentially tissue damaging, that goes up to the thalamus. The thalamus says, that's pain, right? There's more pain than non-pain. But then there's the third concept, which is the key one, and that's suffering. Suffering is, is, a, is, a, is an unpleasant sensation which is caused by any abnormal event in the environment which is not good for the organism, only one of which is pain. So one can suffer from loss of a job or loss, uh, loss of a spouse or loss of self-esteem, or in my case, loss of the Cleveland Indians. <laughs> uh, that, that causes suffering. It isn't necessarily pain that causes suffering. And so our job as physicians, we all, we all uh, said something called the Hippocratic Oath and the doctors have said it for centuries. And it basically says our job is to relieve suffering. We did not swear to reduce nociception and pain. And in fact, it would be bad if we did. Is think of what it would be like if you didn't have any sensation of nociception and pain. Do you, do, you, do you know a disease that does that? A famous, historically very important disease? It's leprosy. Leprosy is a nerve disease that takes away your ability to feel noxious stimuli. So as a result of that, you don't know when your hands are burnt or injured, and that's what causes all the... Uh, uh, distortions of the person with leprosy. It's a, it's a disease that takes away nociception. So you see, it, it isn't nociception and pain that are our enemy. Our enemy is suffering. And suffering comes from the cortex, the cerebral cortex, the outer surface, the newest part of the brain. And so to get to your point, you, you said it exactly right, Ron. The solution to this is not to deal with the, with the nociception and pain, which have already happened in the past, but to do something about the suffering. And the magnetic stimulation, certain medications are ways of doing this. And there are certain psychological techniques that work on neurotransmitters, which help people to refocus their feelings so that even though they still have nociception, they still have pain, they don't suffer from it anymore. And, uh, you know, the prototypical disease of this type is depression. Depression is a form of suffering that only rarely is caused by pain and, uh, and nociception. So, so, so I hope that gets at your question that the, the, the cerebral cortex, the brain itself, the highest parts of the brain are the, uh, the way that we would um, uh, approach a problem like pain in a stump. Uh, it, it, to back to your first, your first point about the surgeon, remember when the surgeon is doing the operation, it's done under sterile conditions, it's all done very carefully. If somebody loses a limb in an accident or in a war, it's a dirty, nasty injury. And uh, they are the ones who are left suffering with, uh, with stump pain. Dave McCarran. Hey, Dave. Do we dare ask you yeah, COVID. He did. He, Turner, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna go on to uh, I'm gonna go on to Dave. And, you might come back I, to you, Turner. Yeah, yeah we, we we have three more hours. To... So. <laughs> <laughs> There's three more hours, so we have plenty of time to get to you, David. No, we got David. It's good all to right. see you. So first of all, we're gonna go to the lower organs because it relates to your discussion. 
about how you became a neurologist, because Marty and I know that when you're describing to people who you are, often when I say I'm a nephrologist, they think I'm a neurologist. <laughs> I have to spell it out for them. Which then brings me to a comment that a well-known physician in Boston and in Philadelphia, by the name of Bud Roman, who I had as a chairman. And Dr. Roman was a nephrologist. And he said, it's a good thing to be a nephrologist because in the average human, it's the smartest cortex in the body. <laughs> sadly, hey. that's sadly true, you know. Really I know. True. So that's why I became a nephrologist and I won't comment on your decision. But um, first of all, I, I want to tell my colleagues that uh, you're witnessing why Marty is as well known as he is because uh, <clears throat> the discipline of medicine, which is being undermined by the internet, suffers from not having physicians who can describe what's going on. And they can't even describe it to physicians. And that's really scary. And uh, Marty, the way you do this is uh, really remarkable. But I do have a question. Um, and it's uh, relevant to today and every day and maybe the history of man, but the notion of hubris, that individuals who gain power see uh, atrophy and certain areas of the brain and increases in others where they don't recognize average people as themselves, that they're not really in that group. And one would say political leaders, uh, famous business people uh, may suffer from some neurological changes. Now, do you believe that? Oh, yes. Um, let me tell you there, and there's some very interesting neuroscience to support this idea as well. And uh, some diseases that all of you have heard of that are in this, uh, in this, in this range. What have been discovered actually recently within the last uh, 10 years, maybe 20 years, um, are something called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons are cells in our brains that are uh, specialized to, res to respond to the neurons in other people's brains. So they, they, they're not doing something internally, they're, they're focused externally. So I'm looking at Larry's uh, face. Uh, I would be looking at him live uh, optimally, but I can still do it on Zoom. And uh, my mirror neurons are firing and they're saying, uh, Larry is uh, attentive. Larry is happy, uh, or alternatively, it looks to me like uh, Larry is angry or sad or distressed. And you can imagine how important these neurons were to our ancestors in the wild, right? If you go to approach the alpha male uh, uh, ape and he gives you the signal by showing his canines, you better have mirror neurons to realize that guy is not happy and I better not get close. Now it turns out these have been discovered in human beings and um, they come in various uh, uh, degrees of sophistication. But if you don't have mirror neurons, then you're in the most severe case, you're what people call an Asperger syndrome or an autistic person. Autistic people are the extreme version and uh, they, they don't have any feeling for what other people are feeling. This is called the theory of mind. Uh, I can tell without talking to you, Larry, or Puff, who I can, whose faces I can see. I ought to be able to tell what you're feeling, not what you're saying, what you're feeling without saying anything. And if I can't, then in the most extreme version, that's, that's, that's called autism. In the less extreme version, it's, it's Asperger syndrome. It's extremely disabling for leaders because they can't tell what other people are how other people are reacting to them. Uh, imagine how, how disabling uh, that would be in interpersonal relationships and even dangerous as it would be for our ancestors uh, facing the alpha male ape, uh, quite dangerous. Uh, hubris is something that uh, we all have to combat. Uh, I have a, a hobby of, of collecting my errors. 
And, uh, and then I write them up in scientific papers and I present them at meetings. And uh, I, just, I just did this twice this past week, one at NYU and one at the Mass General here in Boston. And I present my mistakes and what the origin of them are. And one of the mistakes that you have to develop, uh, uh, you have to avoid is, is the uh, feeling of, of power that you are uh, smarter than other people. And this can happen if people start to kiss your butt. <laughs> and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everybody tells you how smart you are. You think you, you start to think you are smart. And it, it's, a, it's a cycle which is very, very bit dangerous and leads to horrible mistakes. And it, it, it'll get your eyes torn out by the alpha male. And I think when you look, I'm not gonna mention any, any politicians' names, but I think if you look at some recent cases that we've had, you can see that that's the problem. Uh, how would you like to meet with Putin and not have a theory of mind? That would be a serious problem. Uh, and the neuroscientists who work on this are figuring out unique and uh, novel ways of actually measuring people's capacity to do this. Um, you, you know this character, Baron Cohn, this, this crazy comedian, Baron Cohn? It turns out that his um, relative is a fellow named David Barencone, who's a very distinguished neuroscientist uh, at the University of Cambridge in, uh, in the UK. And if you want to do this, you can go to Barencone's website and you can take a test that he will give, that, uh, that you, can you can take, which allows you to just see the faces of people, just their eyes, so that everything else is cut off. And you have to choose the feeling that that person has. Is it angry? Is it happy? Is it surprised? And what you will notice is something that Baron Cohn wrote in his book, it's called The Essential Difference, is that on average, women are much better at doing this than men. And, and not only women, but baby girls, infants, are better at doing this than, than baby boys. Um, Boys have a tendency to be less good at this, and the extreme version of that is autism, which is why we think autism is a disease of boys, um, boys and men primarily. Um, in any case, this uh, Baron Cohn test is worth taking. I took it with Susan, it was great fun, and lo and behold, she was better than I am. Uh, I consider myself pretty sensitive, and it's part of my job is to recognize people's feelings. But she beat me at this test. Try it with, the, with the, your uh, partner of the opposite sex. See if it isn't so. In any case, the point is it's neurobiological, right? This isn't society. This is an infancy. This happens. Uh, something happens in utero or in genetics to make this happen. Uh, and uh, what we need is more leaders who are better at doing this. And on average, that's women. Uh, on average, you know, they're overlapping curves, uh, but that's women. And uh, so we're, uh, with the improvement in our, uh, in engaging women in our important jobs, I think, and uh, br bringing them into places like Williams College, thank God they did it, huh? What if they hadn't done that? Uh, it would have been a disaster for us. We would have left, we would have been left in the last century as a sort of an, an antique, memory of a different age, but uh, they were smart enough to do it. So anyhow, it's a long answer, to, but it's a very, very big question. And I, I would uh, encourage you to look at Baron Cohn's uh, wall, uh, website and to read his book, which is called The Essential Difference, which I think you'll find very interesting. So Marty, should this be, should this be a test that every politician running for national office takes? <laughs> You're not kidding. You're not kidding. Not only that, an IQ test would also be good. For <laughs> careful, careful, you guys. Careful. Um, All right. I'm gonna. I'm Thanks. gonna call. Before I call on John Huffnagel, I just want to recognize Judy Lamphere, who's here with us tonight, and say my prayers and thoughts are with you, Judy, and we're all thinking of you. Um, John, you have some things you want to say about. Uh, future events for the class and also might have a question. So go ahead. 
Well, I do have the question, and the question is the cell phone, Marty. <clears throat> it seems to be a, a world uh, wide thing now that everybody has the cell phone. And what is that? What's happening? Um, I, 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 when I, one of the things I see that an awful lot of people are addicted to it. Uh, but I also wonder, since it's a, a, an electronic um, piece and that goes up close to your ear, is that having some neurological effects on us? As soon as I get off the phone here, I'll answer yep. your question. <laughs> uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, but uh, maybe sometime in the future we'll get together again. But uh, uh, the, the evidence that, that the uh, cell phone does anything to the brain is absent zero. It's been studied in detail right in my own hospital by a fellow named Peter Black, who's a neurosurgeon. Uh, they studied it and uh, debunked entirely the idea that it causes brain tumors or multiple sclerosis or anything like that. So I think that is not its problem. The problem is the dopamine release. Dopamine is the neurochemical of addiction. That's what makes people gamble. Um, it's what makes us have sex. Uh, so it isn't all bad stuff, but, but uh, it, it, uh, it's where opioid addiction is. And uh, this is a definitely causes dopamine release. And it takes enormous self-control to actually sit at dinner uh, and not be those couples that I, that Susan and I laugh at. They were sitting outside at a beautiful dinner and uh, they're both looking at their phones and not at each other. So uh, it's easy, not, so, not easy to do. You have to, you have to put it down and turn it off. Uh, there's many good things about it, John, I don't have to tell you, including a lot of medical adaptations. We can um, ask patients to videotape their problems at home, things that, um, that otherwise we couldn't see uh, because they're, they're intermittent. Next time it happens, take a video of it, take a picture of it. We can follow eye movements. We can follow speech disorders. Lots of things good, good about it, but it is addicting without any question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> John, uh, to respect people's time, they have to leave at, uh, let me see, 8.15 Eastern time. Yeah. Marty has agreed, I think, to stay till 8.30 of those of you who want to stay for the extra time and keep asking questions. But uh, I know John wants to talk to you a little bit about reunion. And I want to just so people who might be leaving, uh, ask all of you to tune in on October 21st, where Brian Murphy is going to discuss his marvelous career in education and 14 years as president of De Anza College. And Brian's passion uh, resulted in a national project aimed at encouraging every community college student that has an education in democratic process. So it, it, fascinating. One of our classmates we don't hear from that much. Uh, it's going to be a real treat. And then John, you want to tell us a little bit about reunion before we allow some people that have to go and then we can continue to about 830. Go ahead, John. Well, okay. One of the things that we have a great advertisement tonight and that's Marty. He's got his William shirt on. He's got his <laughs> Williams belt on. He's got his Williams socks on. Um, <laughs> and so he, he very, very quietly is, is there are the socks. He got it right there very quietly is is getting us to think about about reunion and that may be one of his his neurological um things that he's been working on but we have reunion coming up and, and the college hasn't had a physical reunion for the last two years um but it, in talking which we've been doing the last couple of weeks with ashley card and with others um that we're going to have a reunion in 2022 which will be our 55th reunion. It's on June 9th to June 12th. And um, we're going to be <coughs> um, at Dodd House will be our, our central location because that's every class that's over the 50th reunion. But I just wanted to make everybody aware of it to say, hey, it would be great to come back. That's one of the reasons why we've been having these uh, Zoom sessions is to really to get everybody Take reconnected. Care. Uh, we've had a, a tremendous group of people um, and, and 
very much interested in what's going on with with each other and it really is just it's so nice to see and to be able to keep that connection for all of us um, i would say that if you are looking for college housing it's going to be at dodd house uh, but if you haven't, uh, I, I would think you want to go and see if you can find, a, <coughs> excuse me, a location for um, that particular time, June 9th to the 12th, for housing if you want something that's different than what the college is offering. And we'll be, we'll be back to you very shortly about reunion. We've got some ideas. We want to continue with uh, some conversations like we've been having with our Zoom. And um, it really just to keep us all in touch on a very personal basis. So uh, I just wanted to, while we have a, a large group like this that Marty has brought to us, um, just wanted to say, think about reunion. And I hope you'll all think about coming back so that we can have really three and a half, four days of, of conversations uh, with each other and keep that connection, which is a very strong connection in my book. And so I just wanted to, to put that out there for everybody to, to plug in and we'll keep, keep you plugged in as to what's going on. Well, as Marty, I said, if you, want to, you very much. if you want to stick around till 8.30, Marty's willing to do that. Uh, we have a couple more hands raised and Marty's dog's weighing in on the, the conversation. So that'll help out, Marty. Um, <laughs> I'll call on Bill Clendaniel next. Uh, Bill, unmute yourself and ask Marty the question. Marty, great to see you. Great to see you again, Bill. Um, statistically, I suspect that a large number of us uh, will be affected by Alzheimer's, uh, whether ourselves or our significant others. Um, what can you tell us um, that gives us some hope um, and maybe what uh, I, 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 my Tufts uh, plan tells me, you know, if I have, I think I have symptoms, I should talk to my doctor. What's my doctor going to say? What, what do you do? Well, uh, there's a couple things that I can say about it. <clears throat> One is the uh, fear of Alzheimer's disease is, uh, is, has been overblown. Um, it, uh, it, you know, it was in the closet for many, many years. Hold on a second. Let me do something with the dogs. <laughs> 15 minutes. Hey, Marty, we'll send you some Portland pet food that. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> they want to you know, you know, keep the dog calm. And if you get hungry, <laughs> you need it yourself. They want to, um, they want to play, uh, play uh, ball, but it's not time. 15, 15 minutes, they'll play ball. Um, it's, it has been overblown. Remember, it was in the closet for a long time and people wouldn't uh, talk about uh, senility in, in their families. Uh, and then Reagan announced that he had Alzheimer's disease. And uh, as a result of that, uh, there was a huge emphasis in the country at large on, uh, on dementia and a lot, of, uh, a lot of novels, popular books were written. Uh, movies made and so on and so the consciousness level went way up again thinking about history this happened with eisenhower and heart disease those of you who are old enough to remember betty that ford and, breast disease. and betty ford and breast disease i'm reminded also that's right um, these things take on a larger profile than they actually deserve uh, now that doesn't mean it's not a serious disease but remember Many of the people and organizations who are uh, propelling the worry about Alzheimer's disease have a conflict of interest. By that, I mean they are uh, either in the business of making, trying to make drugs that work for Alzheimer's disease, or they are people studying Alzheimer's disease and they want grants from the National Academy of Sciences. So it's in their interest to frighten people uh, about how serious a, uh, a disorder, how serious a problem it is. Now that, don't let me uh, minimize it. It's, uh, it's important, very important, um, but, uh, but, it, but it is still uh, not top, the top killers that we have in this country. Heart disease is still by far first uh, ahead of it. 
Uh, cancer is second. Uh, so, so you know, keep it in perspective. Everybody is not. Gonna, everybody is not going to be uh, affected by this. It's an age-related disease. The, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. And uh, the evidence we have is that if if we live to be 120, you're right, Bill. We would all get Alzheimer's disease eventually. Um, but uh, the average life expectancy, although it's longer than it used to be, is still in the mid 80s for men. Uh, and men and women are, are closer because of the progress in heart disease, which used to make uh, men's lives much shorter than women's lives. Um, so so the, the truth is that many of us will also live into our 80s and 90s uh, without becoming functionally demented. Now that that doesn't mean we won't have some change in our cognition. Uh, for example, you probably have noticed that it is becoming more and more difficult to think of the names of things as quickly as you used to. Um, and for example, the names of people are harder harder to think about, harder to think as uh, quickly. There's something called the Boston Naming Test, um, which is 60 items. There are pictures of 60 items, starting with very high frequency, easy ones like dog and ending with low frequency, difficult ones like abacus and compass, so forth. Um, and uh, you all would get 60 out of 60 or 58 out of 60 or something like that. But if I timed you, I could guess your age very, very accurately. Uh, in fact, I could guess your age better than an ophthalmologist could by just measuring the amount of presbyopia that you develop. We all have to hold things further and further from the time we're 45 onward. And that's very, very accurate, that change in the lens. Um, but so is, uh, so is memory of names of things. But that never interferes with activities of daily living. And therefore it's not a dementia. A dementia is a cognitive disorder severe enough to inter interfere with activities of daily living. So what the normal people do, of course, is they use various tricks like going through the alphabet, trying to think of a name or trying to put it in a sentence. I remember uh, that guy was my roommate at Williams. His name was Larry. <laughs> I try to get Larry to just sort of come out. Uh, or you keep lists. Demented people don't keep lists. They forget <laughs> to keep a list. One of the silliest questions I've ever heard asked in medicine is uh, how long have you been having this memory problem? <laughs> I've heard people ask. Uh, yes, there are some things that happen with aging. Our gait changes, right? Everybody knows if, uh, if you were a director in a, in, a, uh, in a play in the Adams Memorial Theater and you turned to a young person at Williams and you said, I want you to play the part of an old man he would do this. Right? Bent forward, tremulous. That person could be the president of IBM. <laughs> Not necessarily demented. Uh, right? So, the, so, so, uh, and, and finally, let me just tell you that my, my rule is, is this. It's not absolute, like nothing, nothing in medicine is absolute, but uh, in my experience and in other people's experience, people who complain of dementia themselves almost never have dementia. People whose families say the loved one has dementia almost always has dementia and the person will deny it. So if you're worried about your memory, that's good. That's a good thing. Uh, you know, you forgot where you went in that room, like we talked about earlier. You can't remember an old friend's name. You, you're at a cocktail party. You want to introduce your wife to somebody, and you can't think of his name. He's your old partner. Uh, th those things, that, that is not abnormal. Uh, there are ways of compensating for it. But if you want to, want to do it fast, if you want to be timed, well, th that's different. It's going, to be, it's going to be slower, for sure. Um, if, and, then, and then, you know, are, are there cures on the horizon? 
again, I think that the, the horizon is always exaggerated. And this is a way, consciously or unconsciously, for, for period, people interested in this, for scientists to get money to do their research. They're not lying. You can't, you can't do this kind of science and not believe that you're onto something. You know, this kind of work is very frustrating. So they believe they're onto something. And they, they, they say in their grants and they talk to wealthy donors and they say, we're just uh, another few months, just another couple million dollars and we'll have the silver bullet. Very, very unlikely that that's gonna happen. What we're gonna see is little tiny inch, inchy, inching uh, along improvements, little by little by little. And we've already had some of them. Um, but, but don't let people say that you should be uh, running to the doctor to get a quote, early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there, there's no effective therapy at this moment, including, I have to tell you this drug, aducanumab, which was just released by the FDA for political reasons. Enormous lobby by the Alzheimer Association, put so much pressure on the FDA that they actually released a drug that doesn't work. Marty, I thought it was the president. I thought it was because of the president, Marty, that they released it. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's it isn't clear. I mean, obviously, I was not in the room with them, but uh, their behavior around this drug aducanumab was very atypical for the FDA. They they would never replace a drug like this. Um, do you know that if aspirin? Were, ha were to be uh, put before the FDA for a drug approval, it would never be approved. It's much too dangerous. And yet they approved this drug, which doesn't do anything. So this is a, this is a political problem, not a medical problem. Uh, so there's, there's slow advances. Don't expect a, a sudden salt vaccine. It's, it's not gonna, that's not gonna be the way this is gonna go. And that's, that's because this is a much more complicated disease. Uh, multiple neurotransmitters, hard to get things into the brain. Uh, this, is a, this is a big, big problem. And I uh, think it's fair to say that none of us are gonna live to see the quote cure for Alzheimer's disease. But I don't see that as, pes I'm, I don't take that as pessimism. Uh, I, I think many, many of us will have a perfectly fine uh, older life, uh, but ultimately we'll have to face the fact that, that it's heart disease and cancer. You have to die of something. The death rate in this country, despite all the medical advances, is still one per person. <laughs> it, it hasn't it has not changed don't let people fool you you know so that, that we've changed that we haven't changed that in uh, in eons let let us try to fit a few more quick questions in george did you have another one and i had one i'm going to take the prerogative since i started with one i want to end with a grandparent and great grandparent question about grandchildren. So go ahead, George. Uh, no, I don't. I actually, uh, Marty continued speaking and he answered exactly what I was wondering about. I, I was going to ask about whether the uh, neuro, mirror neurons could, uh, you know, issues could slide off into things like uh, psychopathy and uh, um, delusions of grandeur and uh, 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 narcissism, things like that, but I yeah. think he addressed Well, that. remember, remember, George, uh, as we see it, psychiatry is a, is a very nice branch of neurology. It's, uh, it's, it's all neurology. It's all brain science. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you call it depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, th these are all brain diseases. No one would deny that, right? Even, even, uh, Dave McCarran would not admit that these are kidney diseases, right? Okay. It depends. These are brain diseases. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that. Yeah, you already answered it, Marty. Thank you so much. And, you, and what a wonderful job you've done. I really appreciate hearing you. Thank you. I'm sure we all do. We all do. Marty, Paul might have uh, another quick question, but I, I want to get this one in for the grandparents and the great grandparents and the grandchildren. Uh, I have a very active six-year-old, comes in the room, bangs all over the place. And uh, 
the whole topic of, it seems, of ADD and ADHD for young kids, is it the same thing? Is it being exaggerated or is there an increase? There is not. A, there is no evidence that there's an increase. It's um, it's fear of ADD, and and also people like to uh, like to medicalize. There's a tendency to medicalize everything. I mean, for example, I didn't do um, well in freshman biology 101, uh, Dr. Grant's course, and um, I think it was because I had a viral infection and I was a long hauler and tired. <laughs> <laughs> right it's yes. a bunch of B, it's a bunch of bs that's not the reason the reason i was too damn lazy and didn't study <laughs> that was the reason and so it, it's easy to say you know i have adhd i have a reading disability i mean no those things all exist of course in reality but most of the time this is just um, rationalization for slothfulness Good. Paul, you have another comment or question? We've got a few more minutes. So Marty, you've been in medicine for 50 years and you're constantly learning and you know so much more than we know. And what little I know, I'm just astonished at the complexity and, and the, uh, the beauty and, and, and the how unique, not unique, but the complexity of the human body and the, the, uh, the organism that we call the, the, the human being. And, and you spend all the time thinking about the brain and so forth and, and all the advances that have been uh, achieved in genetics and so forth and how astonishingly complex a single cell is and, and the DNA is. Has all this shaken or affected your uh, understanding of human evolution and the, the basis that from, you know, an amoeba or whatever it is, we've advanced from to this uh, astonishingly complex human uh, organism? It's an interesting comment, Paul. It brings up uh, something, uh, another uh, issue that I try to talk to the younger people about because they all feel like we're on the cutting edge. You've heard people say that, right? We're on the cutting edge. You hear people say, um, we're at a moment that we're going to be able to solve all of the important questions in biology, that uh, molecular biology and genetics are gonna solve uh, cancer and Alzheimer's disease and renal failure and all these things. That's hubris, as Dave McCarran used that term. Uh, that's, that's, that's hubris. People have always been on the cutting edge, right? They, they've always been right at the edge. When um, von Leeuwenhoek uh, looked down his uh, compound microscope and saw living things, he believed that he had, he had discovered the answer to all human disease by, with the light microscope because he was on the cutting edge and uh, now we look back at it and it looks like a, like a quaint delusion, right? How, how could he have thought that? He, he didn't know anything about DNA. So now we think because we know something about DNA that we're in a special position. My view is that it's no different than ever. Uh, we think that our generation is special. We think that we're on the cutting edge. Yeah, we're on the cutting edge, but no different than anybody else. It'll go on right after us and uh, our, our, things will continue to be learned. And uh, if evolution is at all correct, that, that process will never end. It will go on into infinity. Dave, do you have the last comment? Dave, yeah, I'd like to touch upon something that you said at the beginning about the fearful things. And I offer this up actually for everybody who is in our age group. Physicians are not trained to think about not doing something. They're essentially trained to uh, intervene when a patient comes in. And it leads to what you're alluding to, Marty, and it, it is a problem. Because if you go to a physician and they tell you, well, I think we better get this test, the implication is, I think maybe you, you have this disorder, heart disease, diabetes, whatever. 
when in fact the doctor could take a more libertarian, if you will, view, and if you really don't see anything, reassure the patient. Because for a lot of people, they leave that office and they start worrying. And that's not good. What are your thoughts? Uh, I agree with you completely about that. Uh, that it, it's hard to sit on one's hands. And um, yeah, a lot. Of, and so, some of the young people are very obsessed with the idea of always having to do something instead of not doing something. Not doing something is actually a, an active decision. Absolutely. And often the right, often the right thing to do. This is a this is a great time to end where we started with 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 Marty's second father, my father, Doc, said to Marty, why would you go to a doctor? They're paid to find something wrong with you. So he never did. (laughs) Well, you know, the car guys on NPR said, would you ever take your car to a mechanic and ask for a checkup? No. Yeah. <laughs> so listen, to everybody, you've been, this has been amazingly good night. Marty, thank you so much Marty, as, for all your oh, time. It was Thanks a everybody. Pleasure uh, to be back, guys. Really a pleasure to be back. I'll see you in, see you in November. See you, see you live in 22. In October or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See you guys. Good night. Thank you. Bye.